Hello? Okay. Can you hear me like this? I don't have to lean in. Podium is for shorter people. Um, thank you all for coming. Great to see you here. So my name is Jeremy Klein. Um, I'm the Lens Fellow for this academic year. I was here for a few months in the fall and then back for a few months in the spring. Um, yeah, so this presentation is not as uh, flushed out as I was hoping. When I originally got this fellowship, I was like, oh, I'm going to write a book. And then I was like, oh, maybe I'll write an essay. And then the combination of doing really mostly working on the creative research that I did here, which um, culminated in a couple of performances, one in the fall, one in the spring, um, as well as several other sort of smaller student projects. That combined with uh, my recent injury of a broken foot has really slowed me down. So instead of a book or really a fleshed out essay, what you're going to get is basically a conversation with some thoughts I have that I would like to present to you. Um, and really, I'm not an authority in any way. I'm not an expert in any way. I would love to have this spark conversation, have you raise questions to me, have you disagree with me completely, please. Um, <laughs> please punch holes in what I'm doing so that, you know, the next iteration of this could be, could be better. Um, so, you know, maybe a little bit about my background. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in dance and religious studies double major um, from a place called Middlebury College in the Northeast. And then I have a master's of fine arts degree in choreography from the University of Iowa. Um, and I've really been interested my whole life in some of these questions, questions involving both, both aesthetics and art and um, yeah, issues of psychology, spirituality, the mind, these sorts of things. Uh, so I have, I have a, the way I came to sort of the topic of this meditation, I, I'll sort of tell my stories. When I was a teenager, I lived in India for two years. I got this scholarship to this place called the United World College. Um, and I lived in India for two years. And at the end of my two years, I got this opportunity to study arts in Dharamshala, which is the, probably you all know, Tibetan capital in exile. Um, and I lived in the Dalai Lama's monastery, studied Tibetan philosophy, and then would like walk down the hill to Norbu Lingpa and uh, go to the, the art school there. Um, and I thought that's what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to just like live in a monastery, live that life. And then my time there over that summer, it really made me realize, um, for me, there are a bunch of issues, you know, issues with being in a different culture, being in a different place, but also for me, just this issue of being removed from the world and being uh, sort of removed from my body. Um, and I'd always been athletic growing up. I'd, played sports, did yoga, did dance. But after that time, went back to the United States and really dove deeper into that avenue. Because I, I didn't know quite what I was looking for, but I, I guess I had this intuition that there was something about, um, it's like detached, not that that's what all Buddhist practice is at all, right? I, and that, that's like a big blanket statement, but this idea of, of somehow being attached or somehow escaping the world and escaping your yourself and escaping your form. Um, there was something missing in that from like a, a religious, spiritual body perspective. And so, so I think really for me through, through dance and through movement, I kind of came around to this, uh, this understanding of embodied meditation and of the place that the physical self holds in this quest for peace, enlightenment, compassion, equanimity, all these Buddhist principles, right, that we talk about here in Europa. Um, and so, so the sort of thesis of my research that I proposed for the Lens Fellowship was this idea that American improvisational dances were a form of meditation, self-awareness, human development, similar to Buddhist sitting meditation practice, and that this was kind of uh, like fitting the American culture, this, this sort of meditation in action, meditation in movement um, that, that was already here in, not exactly already here, but has been developed here in the Americas. Um, 
Yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of the general the general crux. I have two sort of different branches that are related, but I'll I'll um, get to them in turn. So, uh, the first my first point I really want to make is that improvisational dances in the Americas come from the African diaspora. Period. So when we're talking about Amer improvisational dances in the Americas, even those forms that are not uh, practiced by primarily people of color, they all have their seeds in the African diaspora. They all have their, their seeds in this Africanist philosophy and Africanist ways of knowing. Um, and as you can see, I myself am not black, but a lot of my teachers have been, and a lot of the lineages that I've come from in dance and in movement have been from these people and these ancestors. And, uh, so for me, part of, part of my, I guess, argument or thesis is holding up these forms of movement, these forms of self-knowledge and self-understanding as something that is as philosophically and intellectually rich as something like the Buddhist philosophical tradition. Um, because there's just been a lot of erasure. Right? The, people, the people who you see in this photo, who I don't know what their names are, probably can't find what their names are, right? Like they, they're not respected as uh, intellectual or philosophical geniuses, even though they, they are. Like they're, the way they develop to move. Uh, this is from uh, Hell's a Poppin', I think. It's, a, it's an old Lindy Hop movie, right? If, you, if you've ever watched that, right? It's, it's like, wow, incredible movement. So, um, so I guess a large, a large, so part of, Part of my thesis, right, is to, and again, I'm, I'm uh, not an expert in any of this, but is to sort of argue for the place of the people who've created this, right, that comes from the African diaspora. So American improvisational dances come from the African diaspora. Um, yeah, and I guess just a side note on that is, uh, oh, I'll come back to that, actually. Uh, Right, so another, another thing before I go into uh, some more details right, is, is that these forms, and again, I, uh, I talk about them as Africanist, and I use that term from scholar Brenda Dixon Gothschild, professor at Temple University, I think. Um, she's done a lot of work on sort of Africanist aesthetics. And I use that term because I'm not talking about African dances. I don't, know, I don't really know anything about African dances, to be honest. I only know about diasporic dances in the Americas and how they've affected um, just all the art forms here, right? So, so I've, in my dance background, um, I'll be, I'll have, I have a lot of examples that are from Capoeira, Angola, and breaking, which I've studied for a long time, but also some from contact improvisation, which I've done, um, and a lot of modern and contemporary dance, which is just as influenced by all of this. Things like um, ballet, American ballet choreographers such as Balanchine and uh, Jerome Robbins, like they. They take from these ideas too, right? And so, so even 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 these forms that don't connect themselves back to the diaspora have at their roots these elements. Like there's basically nothing movement-wise in America, I would argue, that is untouched by this. Anyway, just to emphasize the important, like how how deep this goes. The other thing I would I want to point out is that. These forms, these Afro-diasporic improvisational forms, they're not, they're not just performing arts, right? They're not, that is one aspect of them to use in performance, but unlike, um, unlike other performing arts, I don't know, say, say ballet, where you train specifically for the performance, performance is one aspect of most of these arts, but then there are these other aspects, right? There's a community building aspect, there's a self-awareness aspect, there's a, uh, therapy aspect, like trauma therapy, dealing with therapy. There's a, there's a awareness, understanding your body, cultural awareness, social awareness. Like these things are considered just as important as the, the performance itself. So again, in arguing, like why am, why am I comparing dances to meditation? My argument is these are not, these are not performances in the way we think of as shows, in the way that like the American tradition has thought of entertainment and thought of performance. They're, they're a different thing. Okay. 
And I found that. Why improvisation? So what, what I'm going to talk about, and like I said, this is, uh, this is all very preliminary research, but is some of these ways that I see these movement forms being connected or similar to a lot of ideas in Buddhism and meditation and mindfulness, right? So improvisation reflects life, right? Everything, you know, we try and plan, we try and uh, predict the weather, but you, you never know what's going to happen, right? And so I think there's, there's a lot of wisdom in improvisation, right? In learning how to, how to, to flow with what's happening, how to roll with the punches. Um, this idea of spontaneity that you find in Buddhism, um, I think of, I think, particularly in Zen is where I think of that, right? This idea of, of mindful spontaneity, right? Of, of letting things arise and letting things happen. Um, I think really ties into a lot of these principles that are in these improvisational movement forms. Um, as is attributed to Buddha, right? There's some quote, change is the only constant. So again, improvisation helps teach us to change. Um, and in these, in these forms of improvisation, you also have right, spontaneity. Like we think of improvisation or spontaneity as just doing whatever you want. But you have this sense of uh, discipline in order to achieve spontaneity, right? So if you're talking about like Zen, right? Said you know, very, 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 very disciplined. Like people, their schedule is totally regimented. They do all this work. They do all of these things that are really structured to achieve this spontaneity, which is like an interesting paradox. But it's the same thing in these traditions, right? Um, you know, you have a jazz musician has to practice, you know, scales and scales and scales and chords and chords and chords and changes and, and like these very, has to be very disciplined to get to the point where they can free play, right? Where there's this spontaneity can arise. A b-boy has to practice all these different shapes and freezes and transitions, very technical, very demanding, in order to get to the place where you can just hear music and flow with it. Um, and so, so in this sense, again, this is another uh, maybe inversion of how we often think of things in the arts and in um, production, you know, in sort of capitalist society. But, but seeing, you know, in, in these traditions, seeing improvisation as like the higher form, not as sort of the, it is the beginner form, but it is also the, the end form, the highest form. I think I'm saying this because a lot of times in sort of Western academic arts or, um, well, just academia, right? Improvisation is seen as like, oh, you just, you just improved that. You just, uh, you know, you just won it. You didn't really think about it. You didn't really plan it. You didn't really have a lot of thought behind it. And what I'm trying to say is that um, these Afro-Diasporic movement traditions, as well as I would say <clears throat> certain traditions of Buddhism, right? Improvisation is really the, it's the end after you've learned all the basics, you know, to do uh, improvisational modern dance, it's like you have to you have to study ballet and you have to study modern. Then you have to study choreography. You have to be you have to have the tools in your body, and then you have to have the choreographic tools. And then after that, you can really use them and pre-play with them. Um, another thought. I say that. Okay, one last thought on that then. Um, this is a quote from Trungpa Rinpoche. There has to be a certain discipline so that we're neither lost in daydream nor missing the freshness and openness that comes from not holding our attention too tightly. This balance is a state of wakefulness, mindfulness. So yeah, just talking about this, this uh, using discipline to create spontaneity and improvisation as this very heightened state. Okay, um, so another, another element of uh, these diasporic dances and American improvisation that I think is pertinent to Buddhism is performance as process. So in these forms, basically, um, basically practice, practice and performance are the same thing. That's, that's right, I remember what I was gonna say before. Um, so one other thing about improvisation, if we go back, 
I'm using the word improvisation. This is something I learned from some of my dance teachers. I don't say improv. I don't, I don't use that word improv because, and I'm taking this from my teacher, Penny Campbell, um, at Middlebury College, because to say improv is to essentially disregard and disrespect this whole lineage of, of ancestors who develop these forms, right? It's like taking, uh, I don't know, it's like, it's like dishonoring the lineages of meditation and then being like, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go like meds or whatever, you know? So, and again, this, this goes back to this idea that in our society, improv is seen as something sloppy, put together, not really meriting that much attention. So I use the word improvisation because of that. And like I said, I didn't make that up. Got that from my teachers. So <clears throat> back to performances process. So whether, whether participants, whether uh, an audience is there in front of you or not, you still do the work in these forms. Basically, a uh, street dancer or street jazz dancer, they would, whether someone's watching, they find a corner and they practice their thing, or they perform in an arena full of 10,000 people. It's, it doesn't matter. It's about the process of continual discovery. There's essentially no division between, between the, the practice and the performance. And there's really not so much division between the performer and the audience, right? So in this picture, I'm not sure exactly where this is taken from, but this is some cipher um, in hip hop culture. That's a circle where people come in, dance, express themselves, share their movements. Any one of the people watching could instantly become a participant. So there's, there's very little division between performer and audience. Um, I really think that this this highlights some of these ideas of community and of um, and of impermanence, essentially, of process. Which impermanence again is a, is a core tenet of Buddhism, right? Seeing everything as change, and so really valuing process, the the changes that things are going through, right? In Buddhism, they talk about no thingness, right? Nothingness. That like this is not a this is not a podium. It's a a process. It's a it's a bunch of atoms in process. To becoming something else, right? There's not, there's a, there's not a thing. Everything is in process. There's no self. The self is in process. Um, this is a quote from, um, it's, it's an essay from this journal um, on Buddhism that I found. If I see myself as a ghostly mind, it's easy to feel that I'm an isolated and self-contained individual, a localized bubble of consciousness. But if I'm a body first and foremost, then I'm already deeply connected. Once I really get that mind is the conscious accomplice of the body, not its governor, I can't avoid seeing myself as an aspect of the wider body social and body politic. Um, so that's someone's reflections after meditation, but I think my point being that that kind of ethos and that sentimentality is found through something like this where you're moving together as a community and you're exchanging with people and you're not separate in this process of change continual change uh i'll talk i'll talk more about this i'll talk more about this uh when in the next section on mind and body but basically Basically, just to say that um, there are a lot of practices in Buddhism where you have moving meditation. Kinkin, walking meditation in Zen, right, is a common one. Also, Zen emphasizes, emphasizes a lot of physical work. Um, you have certain in Tibetan Buddhism where you have certain meditations that use movement, hands, hand mudras, um, visualizations of the body. So basically, just point being, being present in your body invites you to be more present in the moment, right? It allows us to, to prevent drifting off in a way. Okay, these next five are a little more uh, cut and dry, I suppose. So basically, these five concepts, embracing the conflict, polycentrism, polyrhythm, high effect exposition, and ephebism, and the aesthetic of the cool, are uh, concepts I've taken from Brenda Dixon Rothschild where she's contrasting Africanist movement aesthetics with Europeanist movement aesthetics. But I thought it was really interesting because 
to me, these concepts, she's talking more specifically about aesthetics, but of course, aesthetics reflect larger social, personal, cultural values. But I think it's really interesting because I went through and um, sort of looked at how each of these has a parallel to, to Buddhist practices or Buddhist principles. Um, again, sort of arguing that these movement forms contain certain philosophical and spiritual lessons similar to uh, the philosophical teachings of the Buddha. Okay, first one is embracing the conflict. Um, this is a very stylized design of a capoeira game. Again, those of you who don't know, capoeira is a Afro-Brazilian martial art dance game where it's flowing, flowing movements, flowing uh, dance graceful moves, but there's a lethal martial art system hidden under all of that. And again, this, this interesting sense of, of conflict and not needing to resolve the conflict necessarily. Let me read you a bit from Goth Child because she can speak better than me on this. <clears throat> so in a broad sense, the African aesthetic can be understood as a precept of contriety um, or an encounter of opposites. Conflict inherent in and applied by difference, discord, and ir irregularity is encompassed rather than erased or necessarily resolved. That this principle is basic to the Africanist worldview is manifested in the importance of the crossroads as a symbol of the Africanist cultures worldwide. The crossroads is the locust of the coincidence of opposites. Thus, Africanist art forms deal in paradox as a matter of course, with irony following close behind. Contriety is expressed in African di dilemma tales, in music or vocal work that sounds cacophonous or grating to the untrained ear, and in dance that seems unsophisticated to eyes schooled in a different aesthetic. This principle is reflected in the others, and they, in turn, are reflected in it. Embracing the conflict is embedded in the final principle, the aesthetic of the cool, since coolness results from the juxtaposition of detachment with intensity. Oh, sorry about that. So, um, to, to parallel that, I found a study by a Thai scholar on Korean Buddhism, living in, in uh, studying Korean Buddhists, he says, paradox theory proposes that some conflict need not be mitigated or eliminated because conflicts can help people create synergy. In organizational studies, the concept of a paradox is typically theorized as a unique response to conflicts. Such a conceptualization allows organizational scholars to investigate how a paradox is manifested in one's own decision making. Deviating from the existing literature, the study develops an alternative approach to paradox, um, particularly from a Buddhist perspective. Right, so that he talks about how he conducted a three month ethnographic field work study in Korean Buddhist temple. While living and working closely with Buddhist monks, I found that monks try to make sense of conflicts by deconstructing cognitive boundaries between opposing elements of conflicts, which they believe unconsciously cause tension in their minds. So, again, this, this parallel between basically embracing paradox, embracing conflicts. Okay, the next one is polycentrism or polyrhythm um, of Gothschild's principles. And this is Earl Snakehips Jones, I think is his last name. Famous dancer from the, uh, I wanna say 20s, I think, 20s and 30s um, in New York and Harlem. And uh, like, like very, very famous dancer. But I liked this image of him because it has this really uh, off kilter, unaligned sort of form. Like if you if you go to any any yoga class, any ballet class, the people are like, no, you can't do that with your foot. You can't do that. Don't do that. But he's doing it. And he performed every night for decades doing that, right? So, um, <laughs> so from God's Child. From the African standpoint, movement may emanate from any part of the body, and two or more centers may operate simultaneously. Polycentrism runs counter to academic European aesthetics, where the ideal is to initiate movement from one locus, the nobly lifted upper center of the aligned torso, well above the pelvis. 
Africanist movement is also polyrhythmic. For example, the feet may maintain one rhythm while the arms, head, or torso dance to different drums. This democracy of body parts stands in sharp contrast to the erect body dictated by the straight centered spine. So I, this is, um, to me it makes sense and I wanted to find more concrete evidence, but to me there's, this, there's a parallel concept in Buddhism basically of no self, of if you look at the self, there's, there's no center from which it emanates. There's no place from which it starts. So what you have, I think, when you go deep into meditation practices, right, is a democratization of various sensations from the various parts of your awareness in a similar way to this polycentrism, centrism, polyrhythm, where things aren't initiated from one point is the center of self. There are perceptions, feelings, personality traits, physical parts, such as hands and a heart, but no self. These parts don't have a unity. All right, high effect juxtaposition, which I find similar to um, the embracing the conflict, but this picture is from Philodenko, a Philadelphia dance company, a famous black dance company in Philadelphia. Um, and I, I chose it for this because you have an interesting juxtaposition of this sort of graceful, athletic, pointed feet and arch of the, the dancer on top. And the dancer below could be carrying a sack of potatoes, basically. You know, it's, it's, it's a, a juxtaposition of these different aesthetics, of these different ways of being, of these different moods, all in one thing. That doesn't include, that doesn't exclude anything necessarily. So from Gosschild, we have mood, attitude, or movement breaks that omit the transitions and connective links valued in the European academic aesthetic are the keynote of this principle. For example, driving mood may overlap and coexist with a light and humorous tone. Um, or imitate and abstract move. Oh, sorry, I'm, this formatting is a little weird. Or imitative and abstract movements may be juxtaposed. The result may be surprise, irony, comedy, comedy, innuendo, double entendre, and finally, exhilaration. All traditions use contrast in the arts, but Africanist high effect juxtaposition is heightened beyond the contrast that is within the range of accepted standards in the Europeanist academic canon. Yeah. So I think of this from just some of the stories I've heard, for instance, of the, the founder of this school, um, Trump Rinpoche, you know, of the contrast of states and of switching between states really quickly. Uh, I also think of this a little bit like a Zen koan. You, you have these things that are opposing and juxtaposed so that it, it brings you to some level of understanding or awareness that maybe you wouldn't have gotten through a more sort of steady, logical, uh, reasoned approach, smooth approach. So a story from the Zen tradition, which you probably all heard, but I'll read anyway. <clears throat> a big tough samurai once went to see a little monk. Monk, he barked in a voice accustomed to instant obedience. Teach me about heaven and hell. The monk looked up at the mighty warrior and replied with utter disdain, teach you about heaven and hell? I couldn't teach you anything. You're dumb, you're dirty, you're a disgrace. You're an embarrassment to the samurai class. Get out of my sight, I can't stand you. The samurai got furious. He shook red in the face, speechless with rage. He pulled out his sword and prepared to slay the monk. Looking straight into the samurai's eyes, the monk said softly, that's hell. The samurai froze, realizing the compassion of the monk who had risked his life to show him hell. He put down his sword and fell to his knees, filled with gratitude. The monk said softly, and that's heaven. So using the states of contrast to arrive somewhere where you couldn't get through this, this sort of smooth, logical, reasoned approach. Ephebism. So from Gothschild. <clears throat> Emanating from the ancient Greek word for youth, ephebi, this principle encompasses attributes such as power, vitality, flexibility, drive, and attack. 
Attack implies speed, sharpness, and force. Intensity is also a characteristic of ephebism, but it is a kinesthetic intensity that recognizes feeling as sensation rather than emotion. Um, the torso is flexible and articulate. The concept of vital aliveness leads to the interpretation of the parts of the body as independent instruments of percussive force. Old people dancing with youthful vitality are valued examples of ephebism in Africanist cultures. Um, so above you have clearly the Dalai Lama. Below you have Maestro Joao Grandi, who's a capoeira master from Salvador, Bahia, Brazil. And uh, in this photo, he's probably in his 70s. He's in his 90s now, I think. But he's, he's in this photo, he's still playing capoeira in his 70s or 80s. He's still, he was playing until the pandemic. He's not anymore after the pandemic, but he's a senator in New York City now. Um, but this idea that you don't, there's no, you, you, don't, you don't get old, you don't hang up your quest, you don't just sort of like stop doing what you're doing. You keep, you, you keep going, this, um, this ephebism, right? As, as God's child says, old people dancing with youthful vitality. Um, and I put the Dalai Lama up there. I mean, a little bit controversial at the moment, right? But, but yeah, he's in his 80s, and you know, this, this expression that you might find on a joyful six-year-old, right? This, I, this idea that through this development of yourself, whether in Buddhism or in these Afro-diasporic dances, you find this way to remain youthful, to remain flexible, to remain vital. Um, and it's a different sort of youthfulness and vitality than the actual youth. Uh, I also equated this to Shoshin in Zen concepts, all know as beginner's mind, right? So even, even if you're you know, a very experienced older practitioner in one of these forms, you have this beginner's mind. You approach with curiosity, with eagerness, with lack of perceptions, um, even at an advanced level, just like a beginner would. Hello, welcome, don't worry, just having a little conversation here. Okay, the last, uh, the last one of Rothschild's uh, Africanist aesthetics is the aesthetic of the cool. And she says, this is the, the all-embracing aesthetic. As Thompson so eloquently explains, which is another researcher on um, Africanist dance before Rothschild, this characteristic is all-embracing. It lives in the other concepts and they reside in it is an attitude that combines composure with vitality. Its prime components are aesthetic visibility and lucidity, dancing the movements with clarity, presenting the self with clarity, and luminosity or brilliance. The picture is completed by facial composure, the actualized mask of the cool. The cool contains all the other principles. It is, it is seen in the asymmetrical walk of African-American males, which shows an attitude of carelessness cultivated with calculated aesthetic clarity. It resides in the disinterested in the philosophical sense as opposed to uninterested. In the disinterested, detached, mask-like face of the drummer or dancer whose body and energy may be working fast, hard, and hot, but whose face remains cool. Conversely, it may also be expressed as a brilliant smile, a laugh, a grimace, a verbal expression that seems to come out of nowhere to break, intercept, or punctuate the established mood by momentarily displaying its opposite and thus mediating a balance. Yeah, and that's enough, I'll say, on that. Um, yeah, so this idea of being cool under pressure, of not letting things phase you, of, of maintaining your maintaining your composure, maintaining your calm, which I think is the most clearly translated for me to Buddhism and to meditation, right, into this idea of equanimity. It is, this is a definition of equanimity. It is evenness of mind, unshakable freedom of mind, a state of inner equipose that cannot be upset by gain or loss, honor or dishonor, praise or blame, pleasure or pain. Upeka, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, in Sanskrit, is, free, is uh, Sanskrit for equanimity, is freedom from all points of self-reference. It is indifference only to the demands of the ego self with its craving for pleasure and position, not to the well-being of one's fellow human beings. This is from a Theravada monk. So, yeah, basically the idea that you're, you're not shaken, you, you 
maintain your equanimity, your evenness of mind, right? And through these practices, meditation or these Africanist movement practices, right? You learn to maintain your evenness of mind in difficult situations. Okay, um, I wanna give you all time for questions, so I'm gonna go through this next part sort of fast. What is mind? What a, what a, what a, what hubris. People have been talking about this for thousands of years, and here I'm gonna give you five minutes of what is mind thought. <clears throat> So this is a picture of the nervous system of the human body. Right? And the nervous system extends throughout the entire body, the entire self. Right? The brain is not, there's not necessarily the same distinction between central and peripheral nervous system as we once thought. Modern research on neuroscience has really shown that there's no, there's no center of the self, kind of like this Buddhist concept and this polyrhythmic concept that I talked about before. There's no, there's really, there's no place you can look in your brain where it's like, ah, here's the essence of you. They used to call this in Latin, they used to call this the homunculus. I'll get more to this in a little bit. But this idea that, oh, there is somewhere that where, you know, your soul or your mind resided. And neuroscientists for 150 years looked for that place and gave up because it's not there. The self, if there is a self, right, is created by the entire nervous system, and it exists in your entire nervous system throughout your body. Um, so this is from Sandra Blake C. Blake Lee, sorry, Blake Lee, who wrote a book called "The Body Has a Mind of Its Own." I recommend it's a great pop science book for about um, body maps and body brain interaction. So she says, your body is not just a vehicle for your brain to cruise around in. The relationship is perfectly reciprocal. Your body and your brain exist for each other. A body that can be moved or stilled, touched or evaded, scalded or warmed, frozen or cooled, strained or rested, starved, devoured or nourished, is the raison d'etre of the senses. And the sensations from your skin and body, touch, temperature, pain, and a few others you will learn about, are your mind's true foundation. All your other senses are merely added on conveniences in comparison. After all, human beings can barely, sorry, human beings can get just fine. Human beings can get by just fine in life without vision or hearing. Even people like Helen Keller, who lack both these senses, can thrive both mentally and physically. The brains of people born deaf don't develop auditory maps, and the brains of congenitally blind people never form visual maps. But even deaf-blind people have body maps. In contrast, vision or hearing without a body to relate sights and sounds to would be nothing psychically but psychically empty patterns of information. Meaning is rooted in agency, the ability to act and choose, and agency depends on embodiment. In fact, this is a hard-won lesson that the artificial intelligence community has just begun to grasp after decades of frustration. Nothing truly intelligent is going to develop in a bodiless mainframe. This is from Blake Slee, too. If you were to carry around a young mammal such as a kitten during its crucial early months of brain development, allowing it to see everything in its environment, but never permitting it to move around on its own, the unlucky, unlucky creature would turn out effectively blind for life. While it would still be able to perceive levels of light, color, and shadow, the most basic hardwired abilities of the visual system, its depth, depth perception and object recognition would be abysmal. Its eyes and optical nerves would be perfectly normal and intact, yet its higher visual system would be next to useless. So our, all of our mental functions and all of our mental concepts are built through movements and built through our sensations and our, our sense of, of proprioception and kinesthetic awareness. Movement makes cognition. This is just a little, uh, this is like a little word cloud I made. I had to use these weird spaces because it wouldn't let me otherwise. But these are, all, these are all concepts that use spatial terminology. Right? I'm holding on to the idea. I want to keep moving up. Like, that's beneath me. Right? Let's keep moving forward. These, these are all things that have nothing to do with actual movement in space, but yet you could not conceptualize them if you didn't have a sense of movement, if you hadn't moved through space and hadn't understood what things are. 
right? Just, just as Blakesley talks about the kittens, you know, the kittens, if, if they weren't allowed to move, like, they would still see shapes and colors, but it would be meaningless, right? Because they wouldn't have any understanding of how much distance there is between, you know, me and that podium, right? Or, or how to not hurt oneself falling off of this. And, and so much of our mental constructs are also built around movement, essentially. I would argue that, that even the most abstract thoughts have to be grounded in this sense of space and this sense of body. I would argue that someone doing advanced mathematics, that that is essentially an athletic performance. There is still, there is space to visualize equations. There is, there is concepts of more and less that, that resolve around space. I would challenge you to take 30 seconds right now and think of some concept that doesn't result that doesn't where you, it could be spatially at like there's no connection to a metaphorical or a literal sense of space and tell me after tell me after that i'm wrong um so so it, the word psyche which we often use to mean mind in Ancient Greek actually means soul and mind. It's used interchangeably. Um, so th this is, I would make this kind of short, right? This is a little discussion, basically, of our history of duality. Plato with this idea of, uh, this idea of the realm of ideal forms, that what we see here is not the true reality, but there's some reality that we can't quite grasp that is the, the real, real thing. And for Plato, you got to that through reason. Right, through the mental faculties of reason. This was this like extra sense. Um, and then Descartes, I think therefore I am, is his famous quote, which is a little bit, it's a little bit misused. Uh, if you actually read his writings, they're much more interesting than this dualistic nature that we've credited him for. But his writings developed into the sort of, into the scientific revolution and a lot of these ideas that we have of this dualistic nature between mind and body, right? Um, this idea is not just in the Western tradition. You have uh, in the Indian tradition, this is a really strong, strong concept in Buddhism, in Hinduism, in Jainism. Um, so this is a reading from the Mana, Manavadharma Sastra. I think that's how you pronounce it. It describes the attitude of the aesthetic. He should abandon his foul-smelling, tormented, impermanent dwelling place of living beings filled with urine and excrement, pervaded by old age and sorrow, infested by illness, and polluted by passion, with bones for beams, sinews for cords, flesh for blood, flesh and blood for plaster, and skin for the roof. When he abandons his body as the tree abandons the bank of a river, or a bird abandons a tree, he is freed from a painful shark. And from the Pure Lands Buddhism, um, these realms are portrayed as paradise worlds founded on pure crystalline ground and populated entirely by Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and free of any harmful influences. One is born there asexually, magically appearing within a lotus blossom. Once there, there is no longer any need for sex or eating or presumably excretory functions. It is a vision of the land that is pure insofar as it is free from the messy realities of embodied human experience. So, is this long tradition, um, east, west, everywhere, in between, of wanting to escape from your body and attributing the mind as something pure that is beyond the body and doesn't, has no need for the body and is not necessary to the body. But I think with the current findings in neuroscience, this is completely false. It can't be true. The mind is created from the body. The mind is created from a sense of movement in space. And so to think of some sort of escape, nirvana or heaven, without the body makes no sense. In fact, I challenge you to even consider it. If you look at these images, so this is a Christian image of the soul, this is a Hindu image of the, the Atman inside of many reincarnations. This is, I don't know, some new age image of some spiritually enlightened person I found from the internet. And this is, you're all familiar with, is a Buddhist wheel of samsara. 
But if you notice something about all of these images, they're all embodied. They all have a body. The soul has a body. The soul, the soul can't, this cannot even be conceptualized as the soul not having a body. Um, every concept, every concept I've heard of of an afterlife has some sense of space and of time. These are things that exist because we know about space and time moving through the world. Anyway, I could go on with this, but I want to give some time for you all to, to respond back to me. Um, so anyway, I think this is, this is really, this is a deviation from a lot of the spiritual and religious beliefs around the world, but also a deviation from academic beliefs about the division between mind and body and the importance of mind over body. And the idea that you could achieve some sort of intellectual or spiritual enlightenment simply by thinking or simply by meditating, praying without use, without having the body somehow be involved, I think is, is really false. So that goes back to basically this whole American tradition, Afro-American tradition of dance improvisation, where I see it as this, this way to get in touch with the, to not escape the body like so many philosophical traditions have tried to do, but instead embrace it and use it as this tool for self and other, like for communal liberation, right? Um, this tool for self-understanding, this tool for being, moving through the world and not trying to go away from it. Um, I think it's very, very valuable and something we should, we should think about respecting more and changing our attitudes um, with mind and body and also with the forms, the philosophical, intellectual, and artistic forms that value the body. All right, that's the gist of what I have to say. Thank you all for listening to that. <laughs>absolutely absolutely yeah 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 freestyle again again those forms people train with you know they make choreographies they learn certain moves but then the actual ritual of the music the battle the cipher is a is an improvisational movement right it's it's a it's a anyone anyone who's seen as a really high level um expert in those forms, right? Is listening to the music, is like reacting to the people around them, is listening to their impulses, is taking from their knowledge, from their memory, all at the same time while they're performing. Yeah. Jeremy, can you either repeat the question or ask both to come up to the mic and ask the question? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so that question was, is, uh, is b-boying or freestyling, is that considered an uh, improvisational, Afro-diasporic improvisational form? And I said, yes, most definitely. Any other questions? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to touch on that. I mean, I have no idea. You know, I've... Sorry, the question was, what happens when one dies? And um, of course, I would be... Uh, absurdly arrogant to say I had any answer. But what I, what I would say is that this, this idea, if the mind is born from the body, right, and there's no, there's no disconnection from it, it does seem a little bit grim, the prospect after death. But I don't think it has to be. I think that, I think that uh, there could be a way for consciousness or for life to continue but there's no way for it to continue without a spatial body. So there are people who have theories of, you know, astral bodies, subtle bodies that continue. There's also, um, I think in the field of quantum mechanics, right, there's this idea that, that matter itself has consciousness. And so, so that, that 
consciousness is actually a building block of the smallest elements of of matter and i don't understand this super super well but if you look towards quantum physics there you know they've done all these experiments right where the the observer changes the observer where experiments where molecules behave differently when someone is watching them versus when they're not so so i think that if if consciousness is an intrinsic element of matter then there's life after death for sure because matter continues don't know how or what that looks like, but yeah. Jason. I want to know about the broken foot. So how has not being able to move affected kind of how you've been thinking about this or, or doing your research? Wow, that's a that's a great question. It's a great question. Um So one thing, one thing I, I would want to say to that is um, right now in our culture, we have, uh, it's weird, we, we have like a body fetish with the body as like a machine and the body as an aesthetic object, but really neglect the body in terms of an instrument of sensitivity and of motion, right? Like the trope of a, of a huge weightlifter who can't touch his toes, right? So, so it's interesting because uh, to take a, to not be able to move quite in the way I, I once did has added some, you know, it's, it's added some insight into this, right? I mean, definitely, definitely my own mental, emotional state, right, is, is different, not as, not as fluid, not as adaptive. But it also, it also makes me understand, so for instance, I'm choreographing a piece right now, totally through Zoom, and I can't move, uh, for the Seattle International Dance Festival with some people in Seattle. And it's made me realize, though, that because I have, like the memory of movement is still in my body, and so I can, I can see and I can visualize all of those, I can, things I would want to do, or I know how the sensation is, and I can describe that to other people. Um, and so that's, again, you know, you might say, well, that's, you know, a function of the mind and not the body, but those concepts of mind and that understanding of movement, I could, I could never have had without actually doing the movement. But now that I have done them, I can, I can uh, like, exercise them in this abstract space, essentially. And again, it's, a really interesting, yeah, it's just this really interesting connection. I really do feel like my study of dance and martial arts has changed how I think tremendously. Like, absolutely, absolutely. Um, definitely changed how I see the world. Lorenzo. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you would share with us in terms of, I mean, is, for you, is, is dance a form of language? And if it is, or what is it that we're doing when we're dancing? What is the mind doing? Or what, what the, I don't know. And it's, it's kind of an odd question, because I know it's part celebration or showing, but what, what, what uh, if, if, in terms of, this is something that as human beings we do regardless of what culture or place we're from. We dance, we move, we, uh, and so I'm, I'm wondering what are your thoughts on that? Right, so I think that there are, if, if our if our cognition and our emotions and everything is created through movement and through through motion, right? Then then there's a way in which we can change our perception or change our state of being through movement. That is that is so much more effective in some ways than thinking and processing, 
these these kinds of uh, analytical approaches, right? So, for instance, so so our uh, like I can't touch reality, right? Like I like I everything that I'm experiencing is filtered through my nervous system, right? And so maybe I have enough of a sense of reality that like you know we have a, we have a shared concept of space of you know I, I know there's this much space that's how we don't run into each other or something, right? But I can I can't actually touch reality. It's always filtered through my my nervous system, which is created by movement. And so what that means is that it is incredibly hard to escape that. It's in, it's a, like a cage we don't know that we have right around us. This these the way we interpret the world and we don't even realize that we interpret the world. And what I think is again because thought and emotion are developed when we're young through movement, that movement is actually a really effective way to change and alter and disrupt that cage that we can't see, right? That by trying to move like someone else, that by, by, by having this impulse to move and change our, our uh, you know, the, the chemistry, the gravity, whatever that's going on in our body. Um, so I think that there's, I think there's, there's an incredibly deep and innate understanding of that in people and in cultures throughout the world of just how, how important that is for, I mean, obviously for a physical survival, right? If we go back to you know, for using your body in space, hunting, farming, building things, but also for mental and emotional survival as a way to this encouragement with music, right, as a tool to encourage you to change what you're doing. You change what you're doing physically. It has this, I think, this effect on perception. Any other thoughts, questions? Oh, great. Hi, thank you for this. My name is Swanee. I wanted to complicate the topic of your thesis by bringing up artificial intelligence and the word intelligence. And, you know, um, can there be intelligence without movement? And what kind of movement might be necessary in order to develop artificial intelligence? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, yeah, <laughs> artificial movement for artificial intelligence. Um, there's definitely. Well, first of all, first of all, I can say that there is definitely no artificial intelligence without a body. It doesn't exist, right? Like we, we have this interesting concept, right? Like we, like we don't see the body necessarily, but you know, I I look up something on the cloud or I I watch a YouTube video, and there are warehouses and warehouses in Palo Alto, California, full of servers that allow me to do that, right? Full of servers that allow me to do that. So there's definitely no, this idea that like we are going to transcend our bodies and transcend matter through artificial intelligence, to me, this is just a rehashing of Plato, of Christianity, of uh, body, you know, aesthetic, ascetic, Buddhism or Hinduism, this escape from reality. There is no artificial intelligence without a body. Everything we do on the cloud has to have electricity that runs it. You know, there, there has to be dams or coal powered power plants or whatever to make this possible. Um, so, so there's that. In terms of developing artificial intelligence and develop and needing motion to develop artificial intelligence, I, I think there are probably some ways in which our own knowledge of, our, our human knowledge of space can shortcut some of that. But actually, I do think, I do think you're right. I think it's a big impediment towards developing real artificial intelligence because until there's a body that can be as sensitive and as uh, precise and as alive as the human body, I, I don't, know that artificial intelligence will really be able to do more than just take the programs it has and, and uh, you know, calculate, calculate better. 
right? That's, that's one of those big things between, yeah, that's, that's one of those, I think, the big differences between humans and machines, right? A machine can take one task and do it exceptionally fast and way better than most humans, but the machine can't be aware and as sensitive and creative and combine elements in the way that a human instrument can. But that's a great question to look out for and think about as the world develops. Any other, any other thoughts? Also, please feel free. I put my email up here. Uh, it's not my Naropa email because I don't know how much I'll use that once I leave here. But please feel free to take that down and write me if you want to keep having a dialogue or you want to talk more or collaborate on anything. Um, like I said, this is very much the beginning stages of thought processes I'm having on these topics. Um, and I want to flesh out more at some point. Also, just quickly before we end, a, a big thank you to the Lens Foundation for funding my stay here and for allowing me to come and connect with all of you at Naropa and with the Naropa community and be involved in this really amazing institution. So thank you all for being here and thank you all for being online. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>